So now off with uh, our, new, uh, our new session, meeting regulatory compliance. Um, how to think about materiality with FAIR. That's going to be discussed uh, with real life examples. And uh, so please, uh, Help me welcome Mohamed El Houssani, Risk Director, ADP, Pankaj uh, Goyal, Director of Standards. And they'll uh, share with us uh, the way they uh, done this in uh, real use cases. All right, perfect. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, materiality, and um, with me I have uh, Mohammed. So quick introduction, Mohammed, about ADP. ADP is the reason why uh, many of you are here, many of us are here, because it helps pay our, uh, it pays our payroll, basically. But uh, Mohammed, a quick introduction from you. Yeah, thank you, Bankaj. So thank you, everyone, for having me. So I'm Mohammed Al Husseini. I'm a Director of Risk Identification, ADP. So ADP is the largest payroll in the, in the world. And of course, we are uh, been a customer of Safe since a year and a half, and I'm glad to be here with you to uh, share some of the uh, insights. So. Cool. Uh, ADP is a unique company because it is uh, one of the largest uh, technology companies, one of the largest financial yeah. services companies. So uh, it will be great to hear from Mohammed how he thinks about uh, cyber risk management and materiality. So before I get to uh, Mohammed, um, I just want to recap on what is happening in the world of. Uh, cyber materiality and uh, this has been the like, last four or five months since October um, have been very very active um, a lot of discussion has happened a lot of uh, debates have happened especially in the US market because the SEC the Securities and Exchange Commission's uh, com uh, compliance requirements on materiality they became effective in December 2023 and uh, and companies started actually complying even before that so we had 8Ks or the SEC 8Ks, 10Ks coming out, and a lot of discussion and debates have happened uh, with regulators, with CISOs, CIOs, CFOs, uh, general counsels on materiality. And uh, what I'm personally excited about is that at Fair Institute, we have been uh, involved in a lot of these discussions with regulators. The head of SEC, uh, SEC uh, who is responsible for this uh, enforcement, uh, he was there at FAIR conference in Washington, D.C. in October. Um, the, his interaction with the CISOs was phenomenal. Uh, I think there was a lot of anxiety in the room, a uh, lot of questions in the room. Uh, we At FAIR Institute, we have also been engaged with a lot of practitioner CISOs, uh, practitioner CFOs, um, general counsels on helping them understand the concept of uh, materiality and what to do about it. We also have uh, very active research work going on at Fair Institute. And just a quick recap of what we did in Washington, D.C. four months ago in October 2023. We published Fair MAM, the Fair Materiality Assessment Model, which is basically uh, a PNL way, a profit and loss way, or a CFO way to understand materiality for the Fair framework. Uh, this has uh, been further developed over the last four or five months. We have received a lot of good feedback from the, uh, from the community also on further improving uh, FAIR materiality assessment model and, uh, and would love to invite you. Uh, there has been no new uh, learning material, uh, blog posts, etc., to educate the community about FAIR MAM. This is an open model. Uh, this is not proprietary. This is for FAIR Institute and this is for all of you and uh, would love to welcome your participation, your adoption of this uh, model. We also launched um, how material is that hack.org. So the idea was that uh, FAIR MAM is a, is a model, it's a framework, but then how do we put it into practice? How do we show it in action? So, we, so FAIR Institute launched this uh, portal called how material, how material is that hack.org. Uh, this was in collaboration with Safe Security, where we would take real-time hacks coming in and we would try to estimate the materiality based on only publicly available information. 
So, so far over the last uh, three months, we have published uh, analysis for um, nine or 10 hacks. And uh, go glad to inform that a couple of um, the, where companies have finally come up with their final numbers, like MGM, uh, like Caesars, like Clorox, our estimates were actually very, very close uh, to what the companies finally published. So it seems like we were, we are definitely moving in the right direction at Fair Institute uh, to capture the materiality uh, concept in our analytics framework. I also looked at what happened to stock price. You know, uh, the co whole concept of materiality is um, shareholders should be informed of cyber incidents because it impacts uh, the shareholder value. So if you look at uh, short-term impact, the conclusion is definitely cyber incidents have, material cyber incidents have had a negative impact on the stock price. So on the left side, you will see when companies like uh, MGM, Caesar, Clorox, they declared that events are material, they faced anywhere between 15 to 30% decline in their stock price within the first two to three weeks of the incidents being disclosed. Versus on the right-hand side, there's a, a smaller company called Prague Holdings, um, about $1.3 billion revenue. They also faced a cyber attack, but they disclosed with confidence that the event is not material. And there was almost no impact on that stock price. So again, this, the, this, the positive is that the stock market is understanding that cyber events do happen, the con if, but if the cyber event is not material to the business, they don't need to react to it. Uh, versus in the past, what you've seen is that any cyber news that comes up, uh, shareholders, investors, they react very negatively to it. However, if I extend this, if I take the same companies, Clorox, MGM, and, uh, and Caesars, and look at the stock price as of yesterday, um, except for Caesars, Caesars is still negative. Um, others have almost come back Right? They, are, they are underperforming the index, S&P and Dow, but uh, there is decent recovery. So the question is that what is the long-term impact of cyber incidents? Um, that is still unclear. That is still, I don't think we have a good um, history and data to, to claim either way that uh, long-term impact of cyber incidents is zero or, or negligible versus it is uh, substantial. So it's still a lot to be proven. What we are seeing positively is a lot more transparency from companies on reporting their cyber incidents through because of SEC uh, requirements. And I think the same will extend to Europe very soon, or it's already happening. Uh, events were material. So uh, I think there was a con uh, last summer, I think there was a discussion whether cyber incidents are actually material or not. because. Um, you know, the common theory is that you, as a CIO, as a CISO, you face hundreds of events every day, and uh, none of them is uh, important, right? Uh, none of them actually impacts uh, in large revenue or profit losses. But you can see in examples like uh, Clorox, Clorox uh, lost 225, or it's, it's going to be higher than that in one quarter. Their whole manufacturing, uh, basically they shut down as a company for 30 days. Uh, because of the cyber incident, right? Um, and they had no backup plans. They had, the resiliency was not there. And as a result, it took them almost 45 days to come back to production. Uh, they had to move in their factories from uh, digital software-based systems to paper-based uh, working. Uh, and it took, it took time. Similarly, on the MGM side in, uh, in Vegas, the casino chain, they faced upwards of $100 million of impact immediately because of ransomware attacks. So again, these are big numbers. Um, as I showed you, the quarterly earnings were hurt. The uh, stock price is definitely felt about, uh, they were down by 15, 20, 30% very quickly. But um, there's an interesting dilemma which is happening and that's where FAIR comes in, in my view. Um, what gives me confidence that I, a cyber incident is material or not? So if I'm a CIO, if I'm a CFO, how do I, how do I conclude with confidence that this incident is going to be material or if the incident has already happened is material? And it's almost like the, the, uh, the world of cybersecurity is all about uh, uh, false positives, right? Uh, in this world, there are false negatives happening. So let me explain what I mean by that. 
let's say you face an event um, and you are faced with this question, is it material or not? Um, and what, uh, what I'm seeing is that if, if you can high confidence, you conclude that the event is material and you disclose it, your stock price will likely get hit. And on the other side, if with high confidence, you, you can determine that the event is not material, you will have almost no impact on your stock price. But what happens is don't know in most of the cases. If you do not use FAIR, FAIR MAM, proper risk measurement, risk quantification, most of the times companies, and by companies I mean the general counsel, the CFO, the, uh, the disclosure committee, they will end up at the top, which is they don't know whether the event will be material or not today or in the future. And as it, well, being conservative in their disclosures, they will end up disclosing and saying that we do not know. And most of the dis disclosures, if you read over the last four months, have been we do not yet know whether the event is material or not. Now, what I've seen so far is that the markets assume the worst and you still get the stock price uh, hit. So it is really important to be confident um, in determining materiality and that work does not start after the event has happened. That work starts today. It actually, today is the best time to work on it um, because when the event, unfortunately, and when it happens, um, you will be prepared with uh, answering that question, whether the event will be material or not, in a very confident way. So uh, that's some, uh, those are some observations over the last four months. And with that, I will invite uh, Mohamed or Mo. Uh, um, he has been a great partner for us over the last uh, couple of years. And um, uh, so Mo, well, first of all, welcome uh, to FairCon. And uh, just to start with, uh, help us understand the scale of ADP as a company. So ADP actually is a leader uh, in the payroll industry today, and maybe most of you or some of you are being paid by ADP. Um, we pay actually hundreds of millions of people every day, and we also transfer trillions of um, dollars every day. So it's a, the impact is huge on everyone. That's why when we talk about, we're gonna talk about uh, cyber risk for financial institutions, we see that financial institutions are very interconnected. So we are connected with people, with clients, with customers, with third parties, and with other institutions. So any impact of cyber incident is huge, right? And this is why, for example, for ADP or for any financial institution, we should think about how to prevent a cyber incident to become a cyber event and how to end up with a financial shock because it could really happen. For a lot of other companies or maybe other sectors, you could have a different impact with cybersecurity or cyber risks with any attacks, but with financial institution, it's very special, it's very different because the, the sector is so interconnected and so complex and you could really impact every single person or every single company. You could maybe have companies going bankrupt and so on. You could have a nation uh, going bankrupt. So it's a very delicate uh, role to have and a very delicate role to have as a business and also as a risk practitioner. So. And, uh, and ADP is a truly global company. How many countries are you present in? Uh... So today, ADP, we are present in more than, I think, 80 countries. Uh, so we serve, we have more than 1 million clients as, as a company client, not as a single, not as associates, not as users, but as a companies. So we serve more than 1 million clients across the globe. Um, and we have, of course, different, not only payroll today, we do today IHTM, we do a payroll, we do a HR services, we do a... And consultancies about uh, human resources and so on, and not only uh, payroll. So, so your your challenge is truly global. Yeah, uh, the, the challenge is global today. Of course, ADP is an American company. Uh, I'm in Paris, but it's an American company. But today we are almost in late time APAC. We're expanding in South Africa and Middle East a little bit, and also everywhere. So, and definitely in Europe, we are already here. So, Mo, um, if you think about cyber risk discussion and the concept of financial services industry, how has it changed? over the last two to three years? So I wouldn't say it necessarily changed. I would say definitely we know since COVID that the financial transactions increased exponentially and they keep increasing, right? Because everyone is working remotely, everyone wants to buy online and so on. And plus we also have a new actors in the industry, right? Like everyone wants now to provide financial services like Facebook, like Meta. Everyone is now providing financial services. So we end up increasing the attack service. We end up increasing the risk actually. But the funniest thing that everyone will tell you when they are attacked, if it was in financial industry or not, that they've been attacked with a very sophisticated attack, right? But for example, the financial industry has been always in the top three most attacked sector 
And we see that most of the attacks are actually simple. They are mostly web-based application attacks, which is funny because people think it's always sophisticated, but it's not always sophisticated. Sometimes it's very simple, but we, are, don't, we don't sometimes detect it very well. And we've also seen in the financial sector that today we have around 33% of the threat actors coming internally as internal threat actors. And this is something where we also lack today to detect, right? We are more or less good today to detect and simulate uh, external threat actors and nation states and so on. But today, I think there's a big problem with detecting internal uh, threat actors, right? And this is why I'm hoping like FAIR or even SAFE or other companies that will provide more guidance about how to put a risk profile on users, right? Because let's be honest, users, our users, our employees, uh, every, all your employees are the number one um, vulnerability in your company, right? Beside also having internal actors, right? So, and this is why I'm hoping that in the future we get more frameworks and we fair other can help how to put a risk profile on the users so we can see getting all the telemetries, who is the highest, who is the most vulnerable person in the company, should we limit the access and so on. So I think the financial industry is like, it has the same chances as everyone, but I think, yeah, since the impact might be bigger, yeah. we'll just take it in a different way. So. Yeah, one of the first things that Jack told me when I met him was that people is a control. So uh, that is the core, like one of the core principles of fair cam also, um, that people as a control, like employee as a control. Um, now I would slightly extend that question more uh, to the materiality, right? So you are, as ADP, you are not just exposed to the US regulation, but also um, like across the world, right? So how are you thinking about materiality or how is the financial services industry overall thinking about materiality uh, going forward? So the good thing is the financial industry has always been doing kind of material, because they're always doing their own financial quantification, right? Because we are financial industry, we always have to do it. Yeah. It's our job, it's our also, it's where we excel somehow because we care about money and we, we care about not losing money. So we've always been using it, but maybe in a different way, maybe more manual with less data, with less findings. And it was always difficult to convince like senior management or people, okay, I have this number, I have this estimation, and kind of, how do you get it, right? That's always, how did you get this? How do you justify this? Maybe sometimes it's easier to justify it for senior management or board, but sometimes it's very difficult to tell a business owner or product owner, hey, this is your quantif quantification risk, right? So, okay, how do you get this number? How do, do you even know my business more than me, right? So I think the, the sector is already was using some of it, but I'm now glad that we have like fair, like SEC for example, Rules is gonna push for it and we have fair and we have different stuff to use it. Mm -hmm. But I think this is also gonna bring an additional value, which is like for example, the SEC ruling is that we're gonna have a better understanding of the incidents in the market. Because today we, I know like Metro Attack tried to do the frameworks and so on. So we have, we're collecting some data from different people, even if it's anonymously, so we can know which incident happened and how. But today we lack collaboration and communication in the sector in the cyberspace sometimes, not on, on, on all the companies, right? Like, nobody gonna tell you who, how they've been attacked and how and when, right? They're gonna give you very few information. And now I'm hoping that the SEC also, okay, it's for investors and so they can know how or where to put their money. But for us, I think it's a good news because we can have more data about incidents, how they, what, how they happened, how what happened, what was the impact, so we can use it. Hopefully that the, everyone will kind of play the, the, play the game, but I think that's also a, um, another positive side of the materiality. So. Got it. And um, a lot of our uh, uh, people here are practitioners and some of them are in, uh, have different roles around uh, being a regulator or being uh, lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would love to touch upon how you as the risk lead for ADP, how you spend your day. Like what's your day-to-day uh, -day looks like? I'm sure it is uh, either super exciting or like a mix of excitement and boring, but how does your day look like on a daily basis? So um, it might be a bit different because at least in my company, ADP, we have the risk team is very divided, well divided. So we have people for risk identification, we have for risk assessment, for controls, for finding hygiene. So I technically am more focused on risk identification, right? So I'm also a user of SAFE, so I do risk identification and management and quantification. So and the, when we use such tools, when we're going to do quantification, mostly is talking to a lot of stakeholders, right? So you have to get a lot of telemetries from a lot of teams, from threat, from vulnerability, from compliance, a lot of people. And then you also have to communicate a lot and report a lot to management and also to product owners and business. And this is where it gets difficult, right? So it's a lot of interactions, a lot of convincing, <laughs> which is not easy to do. And I think what I'm trying to do mostly is to bridge the gap between uh, IT and cyber from one side and then business and cyber from one side. Because most people will think that we have a big problem between business and cyber, which is right. But we have also a big problem between IT and cyber because mm -hmm. 
technically IT wants to put, implement everything quickly for business because business wants it, but we end up putting Roblox, right? Yeah. So it's a very challenging thing to do every day, you know, so. So you brought out a very interesting point, like the, there is a friction between, almost like a designed friction between IT, cyber, and then business and cyber, or business or IT, right? Um, what are like one or two things or tactics that have helped you um, communicate with the IT teams, with the business teams. You mentioned dollar risk as one of the angles. Like, can you just highlight like what helps you? So one of the things I'm um, or team working on mostly now is, so the business today and management are very focused on getting data from compliance. And not only I'm talking about ISO compliance or regulatory compliance, but also program compliance, like vulnerability management and point and so on, because this is where we have the biggest gap. Mm -hmm. So they get different compliance feeds from everywhere, but they never talk about real risk, right? And you can go tell them, hey, you have to fix this, you have to patch this, these findings, because compliance is telling me this. And then you as a risk, you can tell them no, because not all your vulnerabilities maybe are that important, not all your patches should be done now. Not, so you have to focus, and this is a difference. It's not a competition, competition yeah. between compliance and risk, yeah. but I think people and business are struggling to understand the difference between compliance and risk. And because each give different priorities and, and different insights to the business and to the IT to, 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 to the IT team, technology team to do, right? And this is where we, everyone I think is struggling today to find the right balance to how to put risk on top of compliance and not to compete, right? And so on, so. Uh, any of you face this uh, dilemma or uh, friction between compliance, risk? What are your observations? You face, go ahead. Yeah, if, I don't know if you can help me. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So um, I'm working in, in Excite Sales. Uh, do you mind introducing yourself? So yeah. uh, my name is Anasela Jamor. I work in Excite so an insurance company. I'm also in a financial institution. And basically, the, 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 we face the same exact problem. Like when he talks about compliance, we do have some internal frameworks, for example, where ultimately the investment is do we try to get something from 80% to 82% because it's a compliance uh, like um, requirement, but it costs like tens of millions? Mm -hmm. Or do you spend this money elsewhere and you agree that, yeah, you know what, it's not that important. We do have a lot to do uh, in, for example, I don't know, improving uh, our earnest trainings or something like that. Awesome. Well, uh, more. I would uh, love for you to think about um, 2025, like two years or one year now uh, from now. Um, how would a successful cyber risk or risk professional look like? What will be your guidance? What to learn? What to unlearn? How to build your skill set? Well, I think everyone, and uh, I think most of the people here, everyone in the sector, and this was IT or cyber, they of course know it's challenging in our domain because we always have to keep up to date, a lot of technologies, a lot of things coming, a lot of updates, a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of threat actors. But when we're in cyberspace, sometimes we focus more on learning more cyber stuff and okay, no new scenarios, new attacks and so on, but we forget also that technology by itself or IT is really evolving very quick, right? So we forget also about learning like now cloud and containers and AI. So there are a lot of technology, technology is going so fast that we are very hard keeping, keeping up uh, in cyberspace. So I think it's very important to understand the technology first before doing cyber. And any cyber practitioner, mm -hmm. he doesn't really understand how it works. There's no need to do security on it, right? Because yeah. it's just the last layer, right? You will have the business, you have to understand the business, you have to understand the technology, and you have to understand the regulations, and at the end, you can understand the cyberspace. And I think this is a challenge for everyone because it's so hard to keep learning and doing certifications and understanding how it works for me, I think, for everyone, so. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, an idea for Nick to learn technology also. Uh, thank you, Mo. Uh, thank so you. I'll, I'll just add a couple of um, pages on research at Fair Institute, what has been done over the last four months, just a quick update for all of us. Uh, of course, more material is available on the website. Uh, we are building webinars, we are building training content. So one of the first things we have done is we have uh, expanded FairMAM to become risk scenario centric. So um, this is the overall framework, but what matters for a risk scenario like ransomware? So in the case of ransomware, uh, what you should be worried about is business interruption, extortion, and network security costs. Um, and similarly, we are mapping it to more and more risk scenarios of, so that it, the use of FairMAM becomes easier. Um, 
we are also seeing that fair ma'am is being used by companies for pre incident and post incident both so i think this is uh, this is becoming a trend here where proactive materiality risk management it's uh, is more important than reactive so you need to start as i said now today uh, on materiality what it means is understanding what are the thresholds for the organization engaging with your gc with your cfo with the cio to determine that with your board uh, understanding what are the top risk scenarios building a framework to understand materiality when a, a potential risk scenario can become material uh, and then uh, agreeing on that framework with your stakeholders that's what the materiality committee or the disclosure committee comes into play that's the role of risk management uh, from a materiality perspective and then of course when it unfortunately if the event actually happens you can use the same framework the same analysis to do a real time materiality assessment for your disclosure for your cyber insurance discussions uh, for your recovery discussions resilience discussions so is the same model that can be used proactively and reactively for materiality uh, we have more publications and i welcome your participation here uh, on how material is that hack.org <clears throat> and then we are collaborating with cyber insurance um, leaders in the markets marketplace also because materiality ultimately has to be aligned with how insurers think about it uh, so we have spent a lot of energy and there is a cyber insurance panel later today um, on engaging with the insurance players so that um, there is an alignment with them on how a company should think about materiality uh, going forward so with that a couple of quick conclusions one we are still learning about materiality second that uh, we are seeing more proactive um working more proactive work on materiality and finally fair ma'am i would say has a strong analytics foundation which you can use in your organization so thank you very much for uh, your time and thank you more for coming thank you.